This week we turn back the hands of time to the chart toppers of Fantastic 4BC in the week ending 19th of March 1967. We kick off this week with the Mamas and the Papas and their tepid words of love. Not a cover of the tepid Buddy Holly song, but an original by future drug fueled maniac John Phillips. Jaunty and vaudevillian, it fits more with the model of British psychedelia, but I can't think that it isn't aimed at cashed up 14 year olds craving a toe into a more sophisticated worldview. B side, a version of Dancing in the Street, is pretty good until you get to the end where it descends into farce. But to paraphrase Aretha Franklin, for all her virtues, Mama Cass ain't no Martha and the rest sure ain't no Vandellas. And in a final dollop of trivia, Dancing in the Streets was primarily written by Marvin Gaye, and he played drums on the original. Number nine is the primitive, urgent, party-starting Gimme Some Loving by the Spencer Davis Group. One of the more underrated British invasion acts, they had an exciting string of singles across 66 and 67. Built around a timeless talent in Steve Winwood, a Birmingham native who played in backup bands for Muddy Waters, Chuck Berry, B.B. King and Howlin' Wolf, all by his mid-teens, Spencer Davis Group merged a Dave Clark Five-style stomp to Winwood's organ and fantastic Ray Charlesy vocals for some good times and great records. Numero Ocho this week is probably the weakest song in the top 10 this week. Pamela Pamela by the mind-benderless Wayne Fontana. Written by future 10cc, purveyor of fine hits to the Hollies, Yardbirds and others, and substandard Ramones producer Graham Goldman, it's a trite, silly piece that tapped out at five and was for some time the last we heard of him. The next we heard of him was some 40 years later when he struggled with legal and mental health issues. Obviously, the last we heard of him was his 2020 obituary. Number seven, dropping down the charts after three weeks at the top, is Tom Jones and the Green Green Grass of Home. An artist like Tom Jones, whose great strength is he always seems to know what his audience wants to hear, accumulates any number of signature songs across his career. But to many people, perhaps even most, the Green Green Grass of Home is Jones's defining song, although Delilah may give it a run for the money. By the way, you have to hear my daughter's alternative interpretation of the lyrics of Delilah, which paint Jones as the victim and the good guy in the whole Sorry episode. It's everything that people who hate country music say they hate about country music. It's 64 pounds of solid cheese. It's the 134th biggest hit of the physical era in this here town. At the Sexy Six, it's one of the weakest singles from a band which, until it got ideas somewhat above its station, was one of the finest single bands of the 60s. The Who, with the breaker of a great streak of singles, Happy Jack. Part childhood reminisce, part druggy man-child ramblings, overly reliant on Entwistle's bass, which is unwisely deployed as the main device to move the song along, although the chorus, if there can be said to be one, does have a bit of the old menacing rave up to it, and the song just isn't a patch on La 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 Lies or The Glorious Kids Are All Right, which preceded it. Also, so they rode on his head in a hurry on key. What's up with that? The B-side, John Entwistle's Macabre, I've Been Away, is definitely worth a listen, sounding as it does like a slightly more homicidal BG song. At five, it's Teensy Weensy Bev Harrell, one of the first generation of Australian go-go girls. Bev was mainly a TV and variety performer, but she had a couple of handy hits. What am I doing here with you being the first? After her last hit, she did several tours of Vietnam to entertain troops and established herself as a lounge singer in markets like Singapore, Tokyo and Hong Kong and even hosted her own TV show in Toronto. She started in the local production of Cats and these days does work for veterans organisations as well as hosting corporate functions and is a staple on the once and soon will be again lucrative cruise ship circuit. In 2006, Bev was awarded the Order of Australia and in 2014 she was inducted into the ARIA Hall of Fame. At Fantastic Four this week, it's Let's Spend the Night Together by the greasy, grimy Rolling Stones, who've cleaned themselves up a little with one of their most storied songs. Stories such as the two policemen who found the front door of the Hollywood RCA studios open and wandered in to check the premises out, only to end up volunteering their nightsticks. You can hear them playing the double part-time at 1 minute 40 seconds as percussion instruments, or the fact that Bill Wyman doesn't play bass on it, Keith Richards does, and man, it shows... 
Well, the fact that it made number three, blocked from number one when Penny Lane leapfrogged it, and this week's number one, whose time at the top was done, in a city where no actual radio station would play it. It was banned in my hometown. Add into the equation that the B-side Ruby Tuesday no doubt drew off some sales, and it's the number one that should have been and never was. It's a good record, and it deserved better than number three, and certainly better than the dog's breakfast David Bowie made of it on Aladdin Sane. A song written by Mr. Cool, Neil Diamond, sits at number three as the Monkees continue their amazing run of success with I'm a Believer, still in the top three despite abdicating the top five spot five weeks beforehand. I'm a Believer was the biggest selling single in the US for 1967 and the third biggest hit for the year in the old hometown. Scott McKenzie, San Francisco, already pilloried on this channel, and this week's number one are numbers two and one respectively. I'm a Believer is part of the lexicon of modern pop music, wonderfully well crafted, made by professionals who knew their audience and how to give them the product they wanted. These guys can hang up the mission accomplished banner for this one. The primary difference between a song like, say, The Lady in Red and this week's number two, Snoopy vs. The Red Baron, is that Snoopy knows it's ridiculous and knows how to play up to that and doesn't take itself with the mock sincerity that Lady in Red smothers itself with. Down from number one last week, where it spent three weeks, it was shuffle off the chart to no great fanfare, and the new record in the series will pop up to ever diminishing returns. One word of warning, do not listen to the album that accompanied this single. It is truly, truly awful. Time to journey to the center of your mind with Fowl's fantastic world of facts. The longest and lingering platter in the top 40 this week is the Easy Beats classic, Friday on my mind, hanging in at number 25 after almost a criminal mere week at number one, 16 weeks thus far on the charts. The highest they do this week is All Elvis, who popped in at number 33 with Indescribably Blue for an eight week scamper up and down the charts, peaking at number 16. The biggest upward leaper this week was Colour My World by Petula Clark. Although Colour My World only peaked at number 10, Clark, despite the handicap of not being Dusty Springfield, had six number ones in Australia. She had her first hit in 1949. She was the only woman anywhere in the world to have a major hit with a twist record, and she sang on John and Yoko's Give Peace a Chance. And even now in her 90s, she's still singing. And the tumble of the week was Dave D, Dozy, Beaky, Mick and Titch, possibly the worst band name ever, whose lively Save Me dropped from 20 to 31. Number one in the US this week was Kind of a Drag by the Buckinghams, which knocked I'm a Believer from its previous position of primacy. And in the UK, well, it's 1967, and no 1967 chart would be complete without Engelbert Humperdinck, this week infamously keeping the Beatles' Penny Lane from top spot with this cover of Little Esther Phillips' Release Me, which is, for some reason, one of the very earliest songs I can ever remember hearing on the radio. <laughs> The number one album in town was, for the 74th of its 76 weeks on top, the Sound of Music soundtrack. Soon, Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass would finally solve a problem like Maria and become one of our new favourite things. So, without further ado, we hand over to Monty to drum us into number one of this week's hits. Bash those bongos, you maniacal monkey! <laughs> Number one is the first ever Australian act to be regular overseas hitmakers, The Seekers, coming out of Melbourne. Georgie Girl was written by Dusty Springfield's brother Tom, two mentions for Dusty this week, yay, who wrote their breakthrough hit, I'll Never Find Another You, and their signature song, the Nick Cave covered, as if it needs that endorsement, The Carnival Is Over. Their version of Someday Someway was the first hit Paul Simon ever wrote. The Seekers broke up in 1968, releasing a Greatest Hits album which spent 17 weeks at number one, first Australian album ever to top the national charts. Georgie Girl made number one in Australia, number two in the USA, and number three in England. It would be a long time until another Australian record was to approach these heights again. 
And that's how the cow ate the cabbage this week as the weather became milder, the days a little shorter, and the top 10 a little more groovadelic back then in the past in that most misty and distant and foreign of countries. <laughs>